Warren Buffett, he just sold 55 million shares of Wells Fargo. That's about 14.6% of his previous stake. I'm excited about that. I love that. I, it's awesome. I added more shares to Wells Fargo on the news this week. Warren Buffett, if you're out there at home watching, you're selling. I'm buying. I love it. And so another one, IBM. Warren, you sold out of IBM uh, a while back. I'm buying. And so Warren Buffett is selling. I am buying. That said, I got to give props to my man, Warren Buffett, because Coca-Cola, he is not selling. I'm not selling. We're both holding it for the long term. And so I want to share something today. I want to share the stock trade that I made this week with Wells Fargo. I want to talk about that a bit. But more importantly, I want to talk about this concept of why I don't always follow Warren Buffett. And I want to talk about a mistake, a huge mistake that a lot of investors make. And the mistake is something like this. Hey, Warren Buffett, man, he's an amazing investor. I look up to him. I want to be like him. You know what? I'm just going to model my portfolio after Buffett. So if Buffett owns something, I'm going to buy it. If Buffett sells something, I'm going to sell it. The problem with that kind of logic is it's impossible sometimes to invest like Warren Buffett. I'm going to share an example today of Occidental Petroleum. This is a company that Buffett owns. He owns preferred shares in it. He owns some warrants as well. We're going to talk about both of those aspects of his ownership. But it's literally impossible to own Occidental the way that Buffett owns Occidental. That being said, so many investors are jumping on the Occidental bandwagon. They're buying it. They're like, hey, Buffett owns it. It must be good. I'm going to own it. The problem with that logic, again, it's impossible to own it the way Buffett owns it. So I'm going to share that with you today. And so if there's one thing you take home from this video today, it's going to be, uh, hopefully, what I'm hoping for the community is to have critical thinking and to be very skeptical of other people out there, myself included. Any other investor out there that you're watching, in my opinion, it never makes sense to just follow that investor. You have to learn more about the investor. You have to learn exactly what their strategy is because their strategy may be very different than yours. But with the mega investors like the Buffets of the world, it's really important also to understand just how do they own those stocks because the way they own it, it's not like you and I own it. And so I have a really exciting video today. We're going to jump first into Occidental. So let's get started. All right, so Occidental. I did a video back in May of last year, May of 2019, and it was titled, Do Not Get Taken Advantage Of in the Stock Market. And the reason that I posted this video is I believed at the time what was happening with Occidental, Anadarko, Warren Buffett was very similar, very reminiscent to what I had experienced as I analyzed Kraft Heinz. Now, thankfully, I avoided Kraft Heinz because... I had seen what went down with the whole deal there and it created a lot of red flags for me. I shared those red flags with the community and I don't want to talk about Kraft Heinz because we've done that so much here on my channel, but I saw history repeating itself and so I saw the red flags again and lo and behold, since I posted that video last year in May, the um, share price of Occidental, Occidental Petroleum, it has plummeted. It is plummeted from $56 uh, all the way down to 42 And so it's down about 24%. Now, that whole correction, is it due to this Anadarko thing and my video about not getting taken advantage of? Some of it is that, but I think some of it as well, to be fair, is the price of oil has been trending down over that time as well. But what happened? Why did I post that video? The reason I posted the video is originally one of my holdings, a company I love, Chevron, was going to acquire Anadarko. They were going to pay a fair price for it. They had inked the deal. Deal was ready to go. Lo and behold, at the 11th hour, uh, Occidental comes back with a counter offer and they bid up their counter offer just to a ridiculous price, a ridiculous price that quite frankly, they could not afford. They couldn't afford it. And so what did they do? 
they partnered with Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett infused a ton of capital into their business um, in the form of $10 billion worth of preferred shares. And basically what happened is with Buffett, Occidental had the power to pay a ridiculous price for Anadarko and close the deal. What happened to Chevron, by the way? They got paid $1 billion cash in a breakup fee because Anadarko broke the contract that they had with Chevron. So I love it. It turned out great for Chevron, but for Occidental shareholders, I would say perhaps not so great because I think Occidental wildly overpaid for Anadarko, but that's a story for another day. But what happened? How did it so happen that Occidental acquired this company called Anadarko? And it was a big acquisition, huge. I believe they paid more for Anadarko than the current market cap of Occidental. It was just a huge, huge acquisition. And so what had happened is they went to Warren Buffett. They got $10 billion. Warren Buffett got $10 billion worth of preferred shares in the combined company, Occidental, which now owns Anadarko. Uh, Buffett, I believe, sealed the deal. It all closed down. It all closed out uh, circa uh, June. And so the talks were happening in May, and it seems as if it all closed in June. And so in June, by the way, the share price of Occidental had already fallen a bit. It's down to $50.28. And so since Buffett got involved and kind of closed the deal, it's down 15%. Um, but again, it's down 24% since all this drama first started. And so what happened is Buffett got what is called preferred shares. Preferred shares are very different than common shares. The way his preferred shares work is he owns $10 billion dollars worth of Occidental, and that $10 billion is paying him an annual dividend yield of 8%. Now, mind you, Occidental right now, I'm going to put some numbers on the screen. It's trading at $42.97. The um, current dividend yield after this thing has already plummeted is at a 7.35. So Buffett is getting another point six five percent uh on his on his percent on his preferred shares and that's after it plummeted by the way um it was uh actually yielding uh quite a bit the difference between the common shares and his preferred shares was quite a bit more before the common shares uh, just tanked in share price and so the um, analysts expect Occidental in 2019 to earn a dollar 72, placing the PE up at 24.98, and the payout ratio is ridiculous right now at 184 percent. They can't even cover the dividend. That being said, this um, EPS is probably skewed a bit because the numbers are just all messed up right now due to the acquisition. And so I did do a cash flow analysis that I'm going to share with you in a minute. That's really exciting, but. Basically, I'm just trying to paint the picture to begin with that, hey, this Anadarko thing happened. At the time, I saw it as a big red flag. I um, I basically saw it as Kraft Heinz 2.0, and since then, it has, it has tanked a bit. Um, and again, I'm trying to paint the picture that what Warren Buffett owns here are not the common shares. He owns the preferred shares, and the preferred shares are... Um, trade are uh, yielding an 8% dividend yield, which is higher than the common shares. Now, something else very, very interesting about his preferred shares. After 10 years, my understanding as, is that Occidental has the opportunity to basically give Buffett his money back and to buy back those preferred shares from him. After 10 years, that's a long time of Buffett earning 8% on $10 billion. We'll get to that in a minute. But they got, they, it has to happen after 10 years. Now, what happens? Are they going to buy the preferred shares back at the market rate? Let's say in 10 years, the market is soft. Let's say the current share price is lower than it is now for common shareholders. Let's say it's in the 30s. Let's say it's gone down more. The way the agreement is written is Warren Buffett will get back 105% of his money invested. And so, again, it's kind of like the way his preferred shares are working is more like a bond. And so he will he will get his money back. And personally, I think he has a better deal there than the common shareholders. Because again, this stock has gone down, but has Warren Buffett's preferred shares lost money? 
No, when he redeems them or when, if the company has the money to buy them back in 10 years, um, which I think would be wise for them to do because they don't want to pay 8% in perpetuity on $10 billion, he will get 105% of his money. So he's going to get all of his money back and then some, and earn that 8% all the way along. But uh, and that's kind of his downside protection, if you will. The way I look at it is because he's getting back 105%, he's got downside protection that the common shareholders don't. He's got downside protection, uh, an option, if you will. I kind of look at it, the way he structured this deal, honestly, it's kind of like an option strategy. He has that downside protection, but he has the upside protection as well. Here's where, where things get so, so interesting. Warren Buffett, uh, as part of his deal, he um, will be getting warrants or he got warrants. And so how many warrants did he get? He got um, 80 uh, million of them, actually. Oh, my gosh. So what is a warrant? It's basically like a call option uh, for for those of you familiar with options. And the way a warrant works is basically... Warren Buffett has the right to buy shares of Occidental at the warrant strike price. And so he has the right to buy 80 million shares of Occidental. And the, sh the strike price, the strike price that they agreed upon was $62.50. And so how do warrants work for, for a lot of investors? Obviously, if the shares are down, down at like, say, $30, Warren Buffett can't really exercise his warrant. That would be foolish because he could just go to the open market and buy at 30. Why would he exercise at 62.50? And so the warrants don't help him on the downside. But what helps him on the downside is his preferred dividend and the fact that um, in, oh, in after 10 years, the company buys him out. They're going to have to pay him 105% uh, of what he invested. And so he's got that downside. But the way the warrant works is let's say this thing runs up a lot. Let's say it runs up to say um, $65. Let's say it runs up even more to like $70. Well, what would happen in that case, the warrants, um, Warren Buffett would exercise them at 62. And if the stock is already trading at 80, he could turn around and sell the thing and pocket the difference. And because he has so many warrants, it basically creates, in my opinion, kind of like a collar on the pre the upside. So common shareholders, you got no protection on the downside. And quite frankly, you're capped on the upside because of this massive warrant grant that Warren Buffett got. We're going to talk about all this in more detail, but I hope by now you already see that you cannot invest in Occidental the way Warren Buffett does. You can't do it. No way. And so a lot of people thinking, I'm going to pick it up because Warren Buffett thinks it's a good company. I don't, Look, if Warren Buffett thought it was such a good company from a common stock uh, standpoint, he would be buying up the common stock. I don't know if he's doing that or not, but it doesn't, based on the reports, I haven't seen that publicized, at least in the media. My understanding of how he owns Occidental is through the preferred shares and the warrants that he has. And so he's doing things differently and I don't fault him for it. He struck a sweet deal. He's a savvy businessman. And so more power to him for doing that. But certainly I can't do that. So I'm not going to just follow along in, um, in Occidental. Now I want to share, what do I want to do first? I'm going to share you on the screen right now, a, um, cash flow analysis. So let's just first look at this. Let's just look at this thing. Practically speaking, Occidental, as it is, in my opinion, doesn't have a lot of surplus cash flow to be paying out this preferred dividend to Warren Buffett. They just don't. They don't have it. And so what's happening, what I want to paint the picture a level deeper here is why would one want to be a common shareholder in this company at this point in time? I just... I can't rationalize it because of the pure amount of cash flow each year now that is going to Warren Buffett to fund this overpriced Anadarko acquisition that um, it just doesn't make sense to me. So let's look at cash flow. So cash flow here, I'm showing you 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19 year to date. So it's only the first nine months of 19 because they haven't finished the year yet. And so that's just nine months. Operating cash flow, you can see it's up and down. But I have an average and the average, by the way, does include the partial year 2019. So it doesn't include fourth quarter of 2019, but it gives a flavor. It, this has enough years in it where it gives a flavor of what's happening on an annual 
basis. And so annually speaking, you got about 4.9 billion in operating cash flow. Now, net cash used for investing activities. And so investing activities, what's in that bucket? It's probably a lot of uh, CapEx. This is investments being made in oil rigs, in oil extraction, in the infrastructure that um, Occidental and now Occidental plus Anadarko are using to extract energy from the earth. You can see that that's a pretty big line item. And it's important to look at a cash flow analysis, a free cash flow analysis, because remember, earnings per share, that doesn't even include capital expenditures. And so it's really important to look at it this way, especially when there's just a lot of weirdness going on, like there is with Occidental and Adarco. So I just like to look at the cash flow sometimes rather than EPS. And EPS already look really bad, so I had to look at it this way. Anyways, the average there is an $8 billion. But that is heavily skewed by 2019, which is just a weird year because of um, the whole acquisition. So if I just average out the four years prior, the um, let me see what I get. The average I get is more in the four billion range, and so uh, 4.1. And but you can already see I got an average operating cash flow of 4.9, and I'm kind of averaging 4.1 if I take out 2019 year to date just alone from the CapEx bucket. And so you can see already cash flow that's left to pay dividends. It's not that much. Now, let's look at net cash used for financing activities. I believe this bucket actually does include uh, dividends um, and other financial obligations. And so what uh, you see here is 2015, 16, 17, 18, I'm just going to average those out here on my computer. It's about a 1.9 billion, but you have a huge jump in 2019. Again, there's some weirdness in 2019 because of Anadarko. Uh, but again, the average over all these years is uh, a positive uh, $3.4 billion. Okay. The reason I'm looking at all of these is the most, and mind you, Net cash used by financing activities, that does include dividends. And so the final line I'm showing here is after CapEx, after dividends are paid, what is left in terms of cash flow? Well, in 2015, they um, lost $3.4 billion. 2016, they lost $2.1 billion. In 2017, they lost 561 million. 2018, they turned the corner. They made 1.3 billion. 2019 year to date, they're up uh, 2.3 billion. So you can see there's been some good years, some bad years, but on a bottom, bottom line basis, looking at changes in cash flow after CapEx, after dividends, I like to own companies that are at least breaking even consistently after paying out dividends and reinvesting in CapEx. Preferably, I like companies that it still have something left over there at the bottom of the cash flow statement. But what you're seeing with Occidental already is they have bad years, they have good years. There ain't a lot of extra room to be paying Warren's preferred dividend. But let's just look at that. On the next line here, I actually pull out dividends. Now, again, the dividends, it's a subset. It's already included above. So this is already uh, covered in the numbers above. But um, what I want to just pull out is just show the magnitude of the dividends they're already paying. They're paying, uh, on average, about $2.2 billion worth of dividends per year. It looks like it went, um, well, 2019 is not done yet, so we'll see. But it's been... It's been somewhat steady over the years. I imagine they've been smart with um, their management, if you will, of their outstanding shares to keep these dividends as low as possible. But check this out. All right, here's where things get interesting. So Buffett, he invested his 10 billion. He gets um, uh, 10 billion worth of shares, preferred shares, 8% yield. How many dividends is he getting? How much dollar amount are his dividends per year? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's $800 million. And so what these preferred shares do to the pie is it adds to this company another $800 million a year in obligations, in interest, if you will, dividend payments to Buffett. And they are going to pay that $800 million 
as long as um, Buffett holds his preferred shares, which is basically going to be until Anadarko Occidental Control Combined Company has the means to buy the guy out, which may not even be after 10 years. It may take longer for them to have those kind of means. And so until then, they're paying out all this money. Now, what does that mean? I just looked, what is 800 million as a percentage of the dividends they're already paying? Uh, if I take 800, for example, and I divide by the uh, average, the 2.2 billion, what is that? Well, it marks actually 36%. And so by issuing these preferred shares, they basically increased their cash flow obligation on the dividend line item by 36% on average per, if I look at the years I'm looking at here. That's a big ticket item. And again, for a company on average that is at the end of the day, losing uh, net cash left after everything at the end of the day, when I average out the last uh, four and three quarters years, they're losing 488 million. They're taking on another 800 million that's not even reflected in that number. It's probably reflected a bit in the 2019 number, but certainly not in the prior years. And so this alone gives a magnitude of what Warren Buffett has done to the company here through his investment. Is that investment buying out Anadarko at those high prices really a good thing for the company? I don't know. Is it a good thing for Buffett? Oh, yeah. Is it a good thing for the CEO of Occidental? Yeah, it makes the CEO look really good. Do these big, uh, big time acquisitions working, working with Warren Buffett. It makes the, those kind of people look good. But is it good for the common shareholders? I don't think so. That's my humble opinion. Now, again, do I fault the CEO? Do I fault Buffett? Hey, I, I'm the kind of person that just wants to wish everyone well. And so I commend Buffett for his uh, striking this savvy deal. Now let's go on though, because I have more to share. And so I want to look at Buffett's warrants. This is where it gets interesting. The market capitalization right now of Occidental Petroleum is $38 billion. Buffett's strike price on the um, warrants is $62.50. I believe it puts an upside collar on, on Oxy around that price. Oxy ain't going much higher than that, in my opinion. He got 80 million shares. Here's where the analysis gets interesting. I take his strike price. I take the amount of shares he controls through the warrants. I multiply them. What's just the raw market cap kind of dollars that Warren Buffett controls should this thing go up to 62.50 or higher? He controls five billion dollars. Again, Occidental's market cap right now is 38 million. If I take 5 billion and I divide by 38 million, he controls roughly 13% of the company. Now, obviously when the company goes up to 6250, this is the current market cap. The market cap will actually be a bit um, higher at that time, but you get the picture. Warren Buffett controls a large percentage of the company. And so what happens when I see something like this is the gears start turning and I start thinking he controls 5 billion worth of shares. If this, if this thing ever gets past 6250, what's he going to do? He's going to buy up shares at 6250 and sell them at whatever higher price he can. He's going to pocket the difference and it's going to cap this thing at 6250. It's going to flood the market with more shares, with these warrants getting exercised, and it's just not good for common shareholders. And so again, this, I hope at this point, paints a picture for you all that sometimes you can invest alongside Warren Buffett and do real well. I've experienced that with Coca-Cola. Quite frankly, he still owns a ton of Wells Fargo, and I think I'm going to flourish alongside with him in Wells Fargo. I think that's going to be a great company going forward. They're obviously facing some challenges right now. Um, but with Occidental, is it possible to invest alongside Buffett the way he does? No, he has a special deal. And so what the next time you go home, you're trying to strategize, just keep in mind that just because Buffett or some other famous investor owns a stock, before you assume you can follow along at home, just be mindful that they may be investing differently. And also, sometimes if they're selling, 
it may be a good opportunity to buy it. That's what I personally believe with Wells Fargo right now. And so I actually want to take an opportunity just to quickly pop that on the screen for you all. Check it out. This is where I bought Wells Fargo this week. I added more shares at 47.17. The um, 2020 analyst estimate is $4.08 per share in EPS. 2021 is 458. And so the PE range on a forward basis, it's in those 11s and 10s, really attractively priced. If I take the dividend, which is $2.04 per year, I divide by the share price, I have a starting yield of 4.3%. And it may not be that exciting. It's not that huge. It's not in the range of Warren Buffett's 8%, but uh, it surely is a nice payout ratio of 50%. So there's a lot of room for Wells Fargo to grow their business. And so when I look at Wells Fargo, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I just did a full analysis on, on a lot of bank stocks. I looked at some of the major bank stocks and I conveyed how I analyze bank stocks, why I bought this bank stock versus another. I think the fundamentals are there. I got to trust my gut. I got to trust my strategy. And when I see Buffett selling, I just think opportunity because he's flooding the market with shares, putting some downward pressure on the share price. Man, that creates an opportunity to me. So my homie Buffett, thank you for um, for doing that. That is helping out. Uh, it's helping me out at least. And so we'll see in the long term how things pan out. I also want to share IBM really quickly. I bought more shares recently. Um, what I show here though on the screen right now are just uh, the current share price. I um, I love IBM. I bought more shares of IBM this year. I think their new CEO is awesome. I think the company is starting to turn the corner, but it is one of the longest turnarounds there's ever been. I cannot argue with that, but I think shareholders are being paid handsomely to wait. Check it out. The uh, 2020 EPS estimate is 1337, 2021, 1418. Again, forward PE in the 11s and 10s. If I look at the dividend per year of 648, I divide by the price per share. Starting yield, 4.3%. Interesting, very similar, the same, in fact, to Wells Fargo. Payout ratio, 48%. There's a lot of room to increase the dividend, but it won't increase very quickly in the next few years because they're focused on paying down debt from the Red Hat acquisition. I've talked a lot about IBM here. I'm not going to rehash it too much, but check this out. I want to share on the screen what Buffett did. Buffett started share, selling his shares in IBM. He did it in Q1 of 2018. So I kind of assumed, hey, he just sold throughout the quarter. The stock was at 162.49 on Jan 1 of 18. It was at 153.43 in March 26 of 18. The average is 157. It's trading at 151 now. And so basically, if I just average out Q1 of 18, I assume Buffett got the average price when he sold. He he actually right now looks like he's made an okay move. He sold at 157 or 158 almost on average. And the thing is trading at 151. This is one where time will tell if he's right or I'm right. I think he made a mistake. I think I'm right. I'm willing to wait. I think it's going to be a long turnaround, but time will tell. And so it's just interesting. He honestly created a lot of downward pressure. What you don't see in these numbers is after he sold in Q1 of 18, share price just went down a lot. It's it's only back at, up at 151 because it's rallied in the last few months. If you look at it throughout most of 20, um, after he sold in uh, 2018 and throughout 2019, the stock was in, in a deep discount of value territory and it's recovered recently. And so again, what it shows though is sometimes when Warren Buffett sells, it's good for investors like me because it put a lot of downward pressure on the stock and I took that opportunity to acquire more shares and I am still taking the opportunity to acquire more shares. And what I love about it is not only the fact that he put these shares, he sold these shares on the market, not only did that fact create opportunity for others because it pushed the share price down because he liquidated a lot of shares. This was a big holding for him. But it's the fact that society is obsessed with Warren Buffett, that it hits the media and it has kind of the secondary effect that it, there's this chatter. It's on the TV. It's on social media. It's in the Wall Street Journal. Oh my goodness, Warren Buffett is selling. And it's this ripple effect. It creates the ripple effect because other investors who like to follow Buffett, a lot of them just see, hey, if he sold, I'm selling. And so it created a downward pressure. And so again, it's one of these cases, Buffett, you're selling, I'm buying because you're creating opportunity for me. And I love it. And I thank you for that, my homie. And so anyways, that's what I got to share on that topic today. And um, 
it is an exciting topic. Before I close today, I got to talk about something that happened in the news today. Six Flags. I recently did a video on uh, Six Flags and I illustrated why it's not for me. I wish everyone in the stock all the best, uh, just like I wish Warren Buffett all the best, but Six Flags, it's, um, it's not for me. And so unfortunately what happened today is they announced a really, really poor earnings report for Q4 of 2019. They have really poor guidance for 2020 and they cut the dividend in a major way. And so I want to take an opportunity to share what happened with Six Flags and what I'm seeing out there and my perspective on what happened. And before I do that, though, I just want to I want to be real with you. I see this trend. I see it because I did a video on this before. Back in the day, there was this guy in social media like a kind of a, a, a leader, if you will, someone high up in the venture capital world. And he was saying, all you millennials, you, you, you're being foolish buying shares of Tesla stock and you're the bag holders. Well, what's funny is since, look, I don't invest in Tesla, but I wish those that do invest in it success. And I certainly want millennial investors to, to flourish. I want everyone to flourish. And so I did a video, I'll link to it in the description below. I remember this one because I was wearing my OG Carl Kanai uh, t-shirt, uh, one of my favorite businessmen of all time. Uh, anyways, um, you know what happened with Tesla. And so this guy was just flat out wrong. He was wrong. And so these guys showed him, they showed him, but I hate that. I hate that kind of stuff because I see it in the comments on my channel. Sometimes I see it even in the comments, people saying, Ian, um, I, uh, people telling me, Ian, you, you made the wrong call on Six Flags. Well, first and foremost, I didn't make the wrong call. I said, I'm not buying it. I said, I don't like it. I'm not buying it. I'm avoiding it. That's not the wrong call. It's the right call. But let's say even I did own it. People come in and saying, you, you lost money. You made the wrong call. And I've seen stuff like that. People out there saying, look at you guys, you lost money. This is so freaking important. Um, no one talks about this stuff on YouTube. I just wanna, I'm gonna pop this on the screen while, while I talk. A uh, uh, quote from the, from the Holy Bible right here. The money that we are investing, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, I, <laughs> I, I, just, I just gotta say, it ain't our money. This is God's money. We are stewards of his money and we want to manage his money wisely. If we are good at what we do, I, I believe I have a gift for what I do. Um, I want to be humble, but I do believe I have a gift. We will be rewarded. I think dividend investing is one of the best way to be stewards of God's money because we're not spending his money to retire. We're keeping the money in the dividend stocks, which will perpetually grow. And then we're using the cash flow to fund bills. I think that's totally biblical. I think that's amazing. That's why dividend investing, I think it's it's a holy way to invest, if you will. But keep in mind, if you're out there and you're putting down someone who's losing money, think about it. Or you're, you're, you're celebrating when someone loses money. You're celebrating, ha ha, I told you Six Flags was going down. That is um, something you may want to reconsider because think think again that this is a loss of money that you are celebrating. You're celebrating the misfortune of someone else. And quite frankly, you are celebrating them losing God's money. Is that a good idea or not? Is that the right thing or not? I don't want to preach too much here. Um, on the spiritual side, I still got a lot to learn. I'm just getting started in my journey. But I just had to throw that tidbit in there because the purpose of this channel it's collaboration. I want everyone to succeed. And along the way, we will all make mistakes. I believe in sharing mistakes and learning from mistakes and collaborating as a community. But uh, look, I was right with Six Flags and hopefully it does improve from here and it gets back on its feet. It may be a turnaround play here. It may be a great turnaround play. There may be an opportunity here to buy more shares and, and uh, turn it around and thrive. I'm not a turnaround investor unless it's in a stock that's of premier quality. Uh, stocks like Six Flags or GE, for example, those types of things. I don't do that kind of turnaround investing, but I know some people are very successful with it. So there still might be hope. But the way I look at it 
is, yeah, I was right, but I'm not even happy I was right because I don't want people to to lose that money. And I, 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 I certainly, um, I don't see investing as a game where there's a winner and loser. I see it as a game where we can all win. And that's, that's what this channel is about. This channel is about winning. And so I just want to plant the seed. And also, though, I want to say if you're one of those people in the past that kind of thought that way, I ain't mad at you. I got nothing but love for you. I, I'm just trying to share things I've picked up over the years as as a person because we're all learning. We're all on our journey. Anyways, check it out. Six Flags. Let's look at it. So what happened with this thing? Yesterday, it was trading at $38.02. Today, trading at $31.50, down 17%. Let me repeat that. This thing is down 17% in a single day. Whew, that is horrible. The old dividend per quarter was 83 cents. The old um, dividend yield, on, not even on today's share price, on yesterday's share price was bordering 9%. Um, the new dividend per quarter got cut by 70%. And the new dividend, um, if I annualize it and then I divide by the new share price, today's share price, it's a 3%. And so basically investors thought they were yielding 9%. Uh, now they're yielding 3% and the 3% is on the new share price. If it's, if boy, the, what is that on the old share price? Let me just look at that really quickly. If I take the 25 cents, I multiply by four, I divide by $38 and two cents. Um, that is 2.63%. And so just, um, just a, a very low, um, dividend yield for people that thought they were going to be getting a lot more. All right, so what is going on with these people? Where, well, there are some big issues. Basically, their China agreements completely fizzled out, and so they're just writing that off at this point. It just ain't working. They're taking charges. The attendance is, and the spending has been weak in the United States, and uh, minimum wages are going up, so their cost, it's going to be hard for them to control costs in an environment where even their core business in the U.S., it's not faring so well. They said um, next year they're not going to do so well, and um, hey, it's it's just, um, it ain't good times right now for Six Flags. And so I want to look really quickly. They, they post a, a metric, adjusted EBITDA. This is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. I just want to look at this number because I think for a real estate centric company, it's an okay proxy of how things are going. And it's a number I was able to easily pull from Six Flags. And it gives a flavor of what's really going on. How bad are things? Is the stock overreacting? Let's look. Adjusted EBITDA for 2018 was uh, 554. 2019, it was 527 million. So their adjusted EBITDA is down 5% year over year. Basically, the business is performing 5% worse. What is expected? To happen for 2020. Well, they gave a range of adjusted EBITDA of uh, 435 to 465 million. I'm just going to assume the worst. I put here in my model 435. In the worst case, 2020 is going to be 17% worse than 2019. And so that is why the stock is down. And it just so happens the stock is down 17% in a single day. It will be up to the fundamental analysts at home to really dig into this and understand is it a turnaround? Is it not a turnaround? Is it overreacting? Is it not overreacting? I wouldn't be surprised if it is overreacting too much here. I wouldn't be surprised. But for me, the key thing I take away from this is quality, quality, quality. I just know who I am as an investor and I flight to quality. In this category, I believe the quality company is Cedar Fair. That's the one I own. I love it. Could this be foreshadowing some stuff ahead for Cedar Fair? Heck yes. If Six Flags is facing weak attendance, maybe Cedar Fair will. Certainly Cedar Fair is going to experience minimum wage issues if that's what Six Flags is facing. And so I want to remain humble here. Look, this could be coming for, for Cedar Fair as well. We know that these companies are cyclical. We also know these companies are tied to economic cycles. Perhaps what's happening at Six Flags is foreshadowing an economic cycle that may be around the corner. So we all got to remain humble here and use this data to understand what may be coming around the corner for something like Cedar Fair or other companies as well. But that's one of my takeaways. The other takeaway that I take here, again, is flight to quality. I just buy quality. This is why I don't mess with stocks like Six Flags. It's just not in my investing persona. Also, though, this is why I diversify. Look, 
let's say I did my due diligence. Let's say hypothetically, I bought six flags. This is probably not a company that would be more than one or 2% of my portfolio. Worst case, it goes down. I lose everything. I only lose, say, 2% of my portfolio. But here, it went down 17% in one day. What is 17% of 2%? Let me just do that really quickly. 2% times 0.17. That is... 0.34%. And so a lot of investors, again, and some of these naysayers saying, ha ha, you lost money. Look, if if people are diversifying really well, let's say they have 2% of their portfolio in six flags and it goes down 17%, you only really lost 0.34%. And this is why it's so important to diversify because sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes I make mistakes. Something I think is high quality like Cedar Fair, maybe I'm wrong about it. Maybe it's going to follow Six Flags in the next few months or the next year. We shall see. We'll keep an eye on it. It'll be really, really interesting. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching the video today. I love you all. Before I leave today, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. Just sharing my journey here for fun and entertainment. And as always, I have some disclosures for you. In terms of full disclosure, I own some of the stocks mentioned today. I am long. I own Wells Fargo, ticker symbol WFC. I own uh, Cedar Fair, ticker symbol FUN, IBM, ticker symbol IBM, Coca-Cola, ticker symbol KO, and Chevron, ticker symbol CVX. I own all of those ones in my personal dividend stock portfolio. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, like the video, subscribe, comment. All of that is the best way you can thank me for making these videos here on YouTube. I love you all. I'll see you in the next video.